Um, hello people, everyone who's joining me, welcome to the live stream. We're going to talk about some really exciting things once Ali arrives. <laughs> this is me, I feel like I should do like elevator music, like do, 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 do. Ali, come on and save me. Oh, thank you, Emily Wakeling, that's very nice. Ah, uh, and Eliza Pooley, I'm sorry if I'm like ruining these names. Um, blah, 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 blah. I'm just reading your comments until Ali gets here. Like, this is oddly nerve-wracking. Like, it's like you're waiting for someone to arrive at your doorstep. Doorstep? Doorstep. Not doorstep. Um, doorway? Door... What's that word? Ali, come on, you need to arrive here. I'm making myself look like an idiot. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for your really... Oh, hang on, I think I meant to hit this thing. Nope, that's not right. Ignore my face, you just get my face. Oh, now I'm breaking things. Hang on, let me see if, hmm, she's still not here. I'm just gonna keep talking to you guys. Anyway, hey, welcome to, um, I just said that before, but welcome to everyone who is now joining, except for Ali, who clearly isn't even here yet. Ali, if you are there listening, can you do like a wave thing or do a comment or something so I can click on your name? Um, this is experimental. Neither of us have ever done like a live between two people before. So this is like me checking everything out. I'm like, this is really cool though, because I'm seeing all your comments. So hi everyone and thank you for your comments. Thank you for your kind words. Um, I spy Crescent City. You can probably spy a whole heap of books in the background. There we are. Ali. I'm now trying to <laughs> let's see if this works. You have to accept something, I think. I'm now waiting. There we go. <laughs> Hi. Hey, hello. <laughs> I think I just made an idiot of myself in front of everyone for probably however long and since I started. <laughs> <laughs> Only a few slight technical issues. I was here for some reason. It was just not showing up. But so many people <laughs> are sharing their love that I think I got lost along the way. I know. That was lovely. I did get a bit caught up on the doorstep, door knob, doorway, door path thing. But we'll, we'll ignore all that for, you know, forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh. welcome to my house. It's nice oh. to be in your house. Yes, welcome to my house, to my bookshelf. Bookshelves? Bookshelf. I don't know. Like, I'm literally in my bedroom, so it's nothing, you know. I, I should have a workroom for this, but it doesn't have as good a lighting, and you get, like, that, like, that weird kind of, like, animal face that's like a panda backwards and upside down, and um, and I just forgot that we were talking to a whole lot of people right now, and I'm not just talking to you, so... <laughs> Well, yes, you have a much <laughs> you have a much better on brand uh, backdrop than I do, but this was my best lighting. In fact, I'm just going to see if I can make it slightly better. Well, your headband no. is amazing. I like your headband a lot. Thank you so much. I needed to dress up for all of you guys. It's very exciting that we're here. I mean, I think everyone Actually, on this call knows. There you go knows exactly what you're about to say, knows that we were both going to wear hoodies and trackies and it got too hot, so we decided not to. <laughs> exactly. We dressed up slightly more than we originally intended, but we hope that you guys are at home in your tracksuits, relaxing and ready for a really fun chat. Yay! Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, the one thing probably Ali and I didn't discuss is who was going to kind of take point in the intro of this, but welcome to everyone who came. We are wanting to talk to you guys about um, well, actually, I had this idea because I keep seeing a lot of authors interviewing other authors on their live streams, and that's really cool, and, and I get a lot out of that as an author and as a reader. But I thought, what about, you know, people who are writers or just interested in the publishing industry? And I thought, you know, wouldn't it be cool to talk to a publisher about the publishing process? And um, Ali and I have worked together. That's, I feel like nothing that we do is called actually work, but we've known each other working together through Pantera since, like... 2014 um since I first submitted the carne to them so um I was like Ali let's do a live stream and she said yes let's do it and now here we are yeah I'm so excited and obviously all of you know who Lynn is um but for those of you who don't know who I am I'm the CEO and co-founder of Pantera Press and as Lynn said I've been with her from day one of this journey and we have so many questions that people have already sent in. But of course, if you have any great questions that you didn't have a chance to send in to us, put them up on the screen um, and we'll be on the lookout for those as well. Um, but otherwise, we have heaps of questions that people have already submitted that we think, um, like, you know. I don't know if you can see this, but we pages. have 300,000 million of them. Um, 
which is great. And that's, that was with culling another 500,000 million of them. And I know these aren't real numbers, but, you know, we had so many and it was so cool to see. A lot of them were repeated. So the ones we're going to focus on tonight are the ones that people ask the most often. Um, that was a really bad sentence. The ones that were most popular are the ones we're going to focus on. Um, and any that kind of weren't as specific to publishing or what we're talking about tonight, we are just, we'll leave them for another time. <laughs> Exactly. So we've tried to kind of chunk them down into sections so it makes sense. Um, and we thought we might start out by talking a little bit about the pitching process. Um, Lynn, do you want to start us off? Or how do you know when you're ready to try and get published? I mean, I, I mean, my flippant answer here is you, you're never ready. <laughs> um, but I'll try and be a little bit more, you know, so when I I wrote Akane um, three years before, like I spent three years pitching a carne. Um, but that was at a point where I thought it was ready and it wasn't actually ready. So I think the best writing advice I would give for this is that you write the book, um, you draft a book, you have to have a full book before you submit it. Um, and you write it and you clean it and you edit it and you edit it and you revise it and you revise it as much as you can. I feel until you get to a point where you, in your kind of self, you think I there's nothing else within my own I can now do I've I've cleaned this as much as I can it's as good as I can get it on my own um, and now you know I'm going to look for an agent or a publisher or however you're going to do it um, a lot of people do uh, hire like a freelance editor but we're going to talk about that a bit later so I won't go into that now um, but you know when you're ready to try and get it published is frankly when I was pitching my book I got a lot of advice on how to make my book better so it wasn't actually ready to get published when I tried to start submitting it um so a lot of it is just a lot of it's in the revision and a lot of it's in the uh I guess the willingness to just stick with it and keep going and um accept that there will be rejections probably and to just keep going with it so that's a really weird answer it's kind of like there's no rules for how you know um because writers will often be your own worst critics and we'll never really know but that's probably the best answer I can give. Nice and probably the flip side of that is if that you're not 100% happy with it then or close to then it's not ready. Yeah absolutely yep uh, yes hmm. I say yes but also like I've got books that are published that I would have like you know that I'm still like why are people reading this why do they <laughs> like it because you know as an author you're always going to like spot your own flaws I think the same way that artists will be like whoop I should have used purple in that or you know musicians are like oh that should have been an E flat I don't know if there are E flats um but you know like different notes and stuff so authors are like oh I wish I'd used a different word so yeah get it as far along as you can without help and then see what you can do nice and then another question we got is how to determine finding the right publishers to submit to. So once you're actually ready, do you submit widely? Do you just send it onto the one, you know, the specific publisher? Um, and I guess I'll share my thoughts quickly and then you'll have your own thoughts as well. Um, yeah. You know, from my perspective, I think that it's really important to understand that uh, every publisher has its own focus. And even if you've written the most amazing book in the world, it doesn't mean that it's the right fit for every single publisher. Um, so, you know, it's really important to be quite specific. And there are many reasons that a publisher may end up rejecting your manuscript, some that have nothing to do with the book itself, including that they just have another book on their list that is for a competing audience um, and so on and so forth. So it's really important to be quite strategic from my perspective in terms of who you would pitch to. And a great way to go about that is even just to go to the, if you're from Australia, actually, let's see in the comments, where are people calling from, joining from Australia, internationally? There's a, there's a lot of Bear and Declan love in the comments. <laughs> there is a lot of uh, character love in the comments happening. <laughs> let's, um, just, okay. let's, let's assume it's Australia and, oh, there we go, there's Nozzy. Oh, oh Serbia. Serbia. Hey, Serbia. New wow, South Wales. New South Wales, Brizzy. Brizzy. Nice. Great, Australia. Okay, so we've got a mix of locals and internationals. So yeah. I'd say for the Australians <laughs> joining, um, you know, the Australian Publishers Association website is a great resource because they actually have a directory of all Australian publishers and they list out what sorts of books they're looking for. So that's a great starting point so that you can really fine tune who you would pitch to. And for all the internationals joining, there are similar um, directories in international, uh, you know, spaces. So, for example, the American Publishers Association has a similar directory. 
But beyond that, just open up a book that you love that you think speaks to the right audience. Look at the imprint page um, and see who the publisher of that book was. And that actually gives you a great sense of if you might be the right fit in their yeah. home. Absolutely. And even bringing it back to the basics, like if, literally it sounds so simple, but go to the website of a publisher and see their submission process. Because when I was submitting to you, um, I don't think you guys were accepting nonfiction at the time, but now it's like your jam. So publishers change things and, and, um, and, and it's always, I mean, I, I, as I feel like I can say this because I, I am an author and I did go through it. Publishers make it pretty idiot proof in that sense. Like, you know, I needed to have direction. So I would go to a publishing website or an agent's like website, whichever I was going for. And it would literally have step-by-step -step guides for me. And so that for me, I think is the best way to contact a publisher. But as Ali said, make sure that they are actually looking for what like the genre that you are submitting. Otherwise it's just a waste of, it's a waste of your time because it takes time to publish. Mm. But it's also a waste of Ali and publishers times time time um because you know they get so many submissions and if half the submissions are for books they're not actually actively searching for then it's you know you're probably not going to get a response other than uh -huh, we got another whatever horror noir i don't even know if i just said that word right <laughs> <laughs> book today I don't know. Um, it's friday night guys <laughs> but yeah um so we, Ali, I we're ready for the weekend <laughs> i know i know i am so i mean every day is a weekend at the moment though isn't it mm. um but while we're talking about submissions, I specifically would really like to ask, you know, what you look for, what Pantera Press looks for in a submission, what makes um, like people more likely to get published, what do publishers in general look for, um, and what are the things that, what are some of the things you need to be thinking about? Okay, I, I stuffed that up. Um, but then well, like on that same thread, what, are, what do people need to be thinking about um, in order to pitch their manuscripts well? Yeah, for sure. So I think, um, you know, in terms of what we're looking for, and to be honest, lots of other publishers are looking for, are definitely stories that are well written, but also well executed. And it's actually quite easy to do one or the other. It's really hard to do both. Um, so what we're looking for is kind of a great story that's engaging. It makes you want to keep turning the pages. Um, you know, you, you really uh, engage with the characters, strong characters. You don't necessarily have to like them, but you have to feel connected to them. Um, and there needs to be a story arc, um, you know, that keeps you going. But on top of that, it has to be well written. So that writing style is something that we look for. Um, and I think, you know, even when I'm thinking back to when we first received the Akane submission, um, you know, that was the, that book for us just had that X factor. And that X factor is really hard to, uh, you know, to drill down into what it means. But actually, you know, it is that piece. Do you want to keep reading? Is there something so so special about this story that you keep thinking about it later? Um, and that was, you know, for us, that was definitely Akane. I'm sure all of you guys listening would agree. Um, but as soon as we read Akane, everyone in our team was sort of sitting there waiting for our invitation uh, into this magical world. So, you know, it is that combination um, of both things. In terms of what people should be thinking about, um, when they're submitting, I cannot stress enough how important understanding who your book is for and where it sits in the market really is. So, you know, we get so many submissions where people will say, there's nothing like my story. It's totally original. Um, and sometimes that's the case. Uh, but that can actually make it, that can work against it uh, a little bit. You know, obviously you want uh, a really special, unique story, but we need to understand who it's actually going to appeal to, who the audience is. And a great way to do that is with comp titles. So who were some other authors or, or series or books um, that you think the audiences of those would, you know, really engage with your story. And it's important to be able to articulate that and say, you know, for the Medoran Chronicles, for example, um, you know, this is Harry Potter meets Narnia. You know, that tells you a lot about the story content. It tells you about the age group of the readership. And more importantly, it sort of says where it fits within a market. And that's a, you know, I cannot stress enough how, how uh, you know, important it is for an author to know who they're writing for. Yeah. No, I, I mean, even as a reader, I like knowing those things about a book I'm about to pick up. I like, you know, I like knowing, oh, this is going to be a little bit like whatever. And oh, I like whatever. So I'm going to like this. And the same for the readability and the same for liking the characters and everything like that. So I think, you know, 
it's almost like we need to remember that people you want people to read the book and like the book and so if those are all the things that's what publishers are looking for i would you know yeah i would think <laughs> just exactly. an excellent, but i feel like i don't know i feel like you guys have this kind of magic brain where it's like you see the potential in a story whereas if i was to pick a book up from a bookstore it's already been polished but you see the manuscript as a draft and you think you know what with a good edit this could be magic um whereas we get the magic at the end result so i think yeah I, yeah i i don't know how you do what i do because quite frankly i don't have the patience for that like if i get a book and i'm not <laughs> loving it within the first few pa like the first few pages and if i don't love the main characters within like a chapter i'm like no nope, life's too short to read books you don't like so yeah editors and publishers are yeah yeah, bye. that's an important thing actually that you've just said because you do read a, a draft manuscript very differently to how you would read a book. So by no means does you know are we looking for something that is a hundred percent polished that needs no work when we're getting submissions. Instead, we are looking for that potential and that promise, and you know there is still that you know that that special feeling that comes from it. But absolutely, um, you know, all books that we publish need editorial work and we'll talk more about that later um but it's important not for people not to be thinking that they have to submit something that is 100 percent perfect because that's not the case um uh, speaking of which lynn do you want to tell us a little bit about your sort of journey pre-pantera uh, you know were you rejected before getting a publishing deal with us how long did it actually take you to find us give us a bit of insight yeah, so um, it took me about three years to get a publisher. I wrote uh, a car name and I never, it, like a lot of people, if you've seen me in real person, <laughs> I don't know what just happened to my mouth. If you've been to any of my events, you will have heard the, you know, that I never intended anyone to read a car name. I wrote it purely because I couldn't find a book that I wanted to read. Um, and when I finished it, I was, you know, I was delighted with it. I loved the characters, I loved the story, but I still... I still didn't want anyone else to read it. Um, but at the end of Akane, I was like, well, this could go on, you know, what happens next with Alex and her friends. And so I went on and I wrote Raylia and um, still just for me. And when I finished Raylia, I was, you know, if anyone who's read Raylia, you'll know that it kind of ends on like this cliffhanger. And um, and I just had this, this moment, this total freak out when I realized that I wanted to continue the series but more, I wanted to share it with other people. I wanted to talk to people about these characters who had become so real for me. Um, and I didn't know anyone in the publishing world. I didn't know any other authors. I had no experience whatsoever. And so I started a lot of research and I was, uh, the one thing I knew is that I didn't have the inner um, confidence, I guess you could say, I don't know if that's the word, but to get self-published, I didn't believe in myself enough to think that, you know, to go down a self-publishing path. I thought if my book, deserved to be read or if my books were good enough to be read then I needed a traditional publisher telling me that you know this doesn't completely suck um and so that's just me personally I have so much so much insane respect for self-published authors they do so much work and it's just an amazing amazing um path to go down with publishing but I personally and myself need a traditional and so then I was deciding you know do I look for an agent do I look for a publisher first and at that point in Australia it was impossible to get an agent without a publisher but it was really hard to get a publisher without an agent as well and so it was like I felt like I was in this unending spiral of impossibility to get into the industry um and so I started looking for agents overseas and a lot of them were like love this book. This is Akane, by the way. I love this book, but YA fantasy isn't a thing at the moment. And at the time, we're talking 2011, it was like, it was post-Twilight. So it was vampires. It was um, werewolves. It was a lot of paranormal. It was a lot of, it wasn't really fantasy. And so they're like, this is great. The characters are amazing, but there's just no uh, market for it right now, which is what Ali was saying before, you know, your book might be good, but it just isn't what publishers are looking for at the time. Um, and so that was three years essentially of me trying to get published and um, being told the story was good, but just not something that would fit in the industry at the time. And that was that was probably really quite hard because I remember thinking if this, if I'm being told that this book is good, but that people just won't buy it because it's not on trend or whatever at the moment, then when will it, you know, what, why, what, why would anyone ever pick it up? Um, but then one day I was walking in Big W and I picked up a book that Pantera had just published. It's called Betrothed by Wanda Wiltshire. Wiltshire? What? How did you say Wiltshire? Wiltshire? Wiltshire. Wiltshire. It's one of those names that's S-H-I-R-E at the end and I'm like, mm, I don't know. Um, 
but it was this if anyone's seen that book it's got this like shiny cover and it's just so eye-catching because it's really beautiful and I am such a cover snob uh, that I picked the book up without even reading the blurb and I went home and I saw that it was by a publisher who I'd never heard of it was a relatively new publisher um, and so I looked them up and they were actually accepting unsolicited manuscripts uh, and so this is Pantera Press and I, and it's so rare at the time to find a publisher who would accept an unsolicited uh, so that means you don't have an agent you haven't had any interview you haven't had any prior contact with the publisher uh and so I sent off a submission and I thought this is my last my last go I'm going to write another book I'm going to see what else happens but at the moment there's nothing for Akane so I'll just leave it um and so I um I submitted it and then I forgot about it and uh, seven months later I got an email out of the blue literally saying we'd like to publish your book um and I was on my way to I think I was on my way to get like a mole cut out or the dentist it was some kind of medical appointment <laughs> and I remember it because I remember like reading the email in my car scoffing thinking my brother had hacked my emails putting it down and then later realizing when I was at the medical appointment my brother doesn't know how to hack emails <laughs> and I was literally in this doctor surgery place when I kind of just jumped up and I did a twirl in front of the medical professional and I was like I just got a publishing offer and they're like can you please sit down and it was just this like I just didn't believe it it didn't quite sink in um but a month later I was on a plane to meet everyone at Pantera and sign a contract and now here I am <laughs> And it's so nice while you've been chatting to look at some of the comments you were talking about, you know, your characters and how you loved them and you didn't know if other people would love them. And there's literally just been a constant stream of love fest of all of your characters <laughs> while you've been talking. Oh, so it's so nice. <laughs> that is lovely. <laughs> yeah. Well, should we talk about the writing process a little bit? Um, you know, when you were thinking about the Medoran Chronicles way back when, did you have the whole series planned out? I mean, you kind of spoke <laughs> about that a little bit. Um, but, you know, did you know where it was going to go? I mean, I had no idea. And a funny story about this, I don't even know if Ali knows this, but um, so when I went in to meet Pantera um, after I'd been offered the contract and I had the first two books written, as I mentioned before, but they'd only seen Akane. And so when I was in there in person, um, they were asking me, they being Ali and the rest of the team were like, do you know, do you know how many books this is going to be? And I was like, well, I've written the second book. And they were like, yay, we want to read it. Um, and then they're like, so this is a series, how many books do you envision? And I just, I was just like, Oh, oh, five. <laughs> and I just kind of was like, I just pulled a number out. And then uh, Marty, who um, is the, he, at the time, he was the editorial submissions um, uh, editor. Yeah. Submissions editor. So Marty was the one who first contacted me. Um, and uh, he, I, I think he, in an email after that, asked me, you know, can you give us a, plot outline for the rest of the for the rest of the series and uh, anyone who knows me now knows that I cannot plan for my life um and I was like sure I can do that and so I just remember having this total freak out because I had to come up with this like five book plan thankfully the first two were already written but I had to come up with like names of the next three books and now it's like a six book series but I had to come up with names and some of them didn't stick and I had to be like yes this is exactly what's going to happen at this point and this point literally nothing in that plan document that I sent actually happened so it was a very long way to answer your question um I said I knew what the series was about I had no idea what the series was about and I still have no idea how I ended up writing that series <laughs> so hmm. I'm gonna go back and see if I can find that plan document and just see how different it was to the actual series I mean, everything changes in Dracora because in the Dracora, I can't remember what I wrote for the later books, but I know in Dracora it's like, and there's a big fire and then something happens with a fire in the forest and then Avon is there and Alex has to save people from the fire. Why was I going to have a fire? I don't know. But <laughs> yeah, I, I, needless to say, Alex surprised me when she went back to that place she went back to and she was never meant to go back to that place and everything changed from there. But whew. That would have been a very different book if I'd stuck to the plan. <laughs> I'm going to see if I, can, if I can dig it up, I will send it to you <laughs> and we can excellent. post it. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Please don't. That would be like <laughs> the pinnacle of embarrassment in my career. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have another question and you sort of touched on this a little bit before when you said you were writing and, you know, all the books that were selling at the time were vampires and you didn't feel like there was a, you know, a, a big market for what you were writing pre-publication. Um, so this person has asked, or these people have asked, 
should you write to a trend? So, you know, Lynn, did you have Harry Potter in mind when you were writing the Medoran Chronicles or even Divergent in mind when you were writing your Whisper series? You know, are you trying to write to a trend or, or do you ignore the trends? I absolutely ignore the trends. I want to ask this question back at you, but my, mm. my, um, my understanding and my strong, firm belief is that if I was to write to a trend right now, so at the moment, what are some trends? I can't even think of any. Um, I'm sure I could think of a heap if I actually stopped and thought, but you know, if a trend right now was... Um, no, Greek myth, it. for example. Was what? Greek mythology, for example. Greek mythology. If a trend right now is Greek mythology, if I was to write a book today and finish that book today, which is impossible, but let's say I did finish the book today. If I thought this, if I woke up this morning and thought, you know what, Greek mythology is taking off. I'm going to write a hundred thousand word book in a day and it's going to be, it's going to fit in nicely. The thing is publishing takes time like it takes mm. uh, you know I, I don't want to put a time limit on it but I would like to say at least a year for a book to be public to be edited properly multiple rounds of editing proper marketing and publicity if it's a debut book or a first book in a series it takes longer than a year usually because there's a more of a marketing plan and so 12 months from now Greek mythology is probably completely on the outs like it'll be like Roman mythology or something I don't know it'll be something it'll be back to vampires you know um and so Writing to a trend is dangerous um, in that sense because it's probably not going to pay off. But even if it does pay off, I feel like as a writer, it takes some of the joy out of the writing if I'm only writing for money or for fame that I think is going to slot something in. Um, because mm -hmm. as a writer, I have to write from my heart. And so I did write with Harry Potter in mind in the sense that I love Harry Potter and I love the feeling it evoked in me, the magic and the wonder. But I didn't write it in a sense of, well, Harry Potter sold really well, so this will sell really well. Like I said, I didn't want anyone to read Akane. I never, ever intended anyone to read that series until I weirdly started fangirling about my own characters and wanted to share them. Um, so that was <laughs> my only motivation was, I need people to talk to about this. Um, so yeah, I didn't write to a trend. And as I said, YA fantasy really wasn't pumping at all when I when I wrote it or when I was trying to write it. But as a publisher, how do you, what is your answer? Should people write to a trend? Should they write... Greek mythology because it's no you're shaking your head no I agree with you completely I think never ever ever write to a trend and for the exact reason that you said trends die and change and fluctuate all the time um, and so it's far better just to write the book that you would love to read um, or the book you know that you think will appeal to a very specific audience that you think that you're writing for and at the end of the day the focus should always be on just writing a really great story um, that you enjoy and that you think that others might enjoy and really just forget about um, what other people are writing and what's working at the time perfect i like that answer and i agree with that answer on the same page um, <laughs> <laughs> okay i've got one more writing question for you um, did you did you ever get the feeling that your writing wasn't good enough? Um, and do you ever feel down about writing, you know, when you're in the manuscript writing process? Oh, that's a great question. And I was actually asked this by a few different people in a few different ways. Um, and so we wanted to add it in this. Um, Look, the funny thing is when I'm in writing mode, I'm just in writing mode. I'm like discovering things as my characters discover them. And so it doesn't flitter through my mind whether what I'm writing is good or not, because I'm just like on a train that's going somewhere but when I stop absolutely I'm always like whoa you know like it's more before I write something like if I'm about to slow down if I'm about to start writing a new book um I'm literally like how do you what are, what are words how do I write a book how do I do this and I've written I've written so many books now like I've written a published eight I've written at least three others um you know, these are, this is like a natural setting for me. And yet every single time I sit at a blank page and think, I, I don't know how to write a book. And then once I start writing, I'm totally in the zone and I'm loving it. But when I stop writing, I'm like, this is terrible. This is awful. No one will ever read this. But that's when I kind of have to reel myself back and remember why I started writing. And when I started writing Akane, it was because, as I already said, it was the book I wanted to read. And I genuinely loved writing it. I loved, I loved meeting the characters and getting to know them and, and, and journeying along with them. And so when I start to freak out about the quality of my writing or what's happening with my story or the characters, that's when I have to think, am I doing this because I love it or because I have to do it? And if I'm doing it because I have to do it, I have to change my priority because otherwise it's just, it's going to, I have this saying and, um, 
I, I say that like if you're bored writing it, people will be bored reading it. But I I say that for any emotion, if you are you know really struggling writing it, it will be a struggle to readers. Um, so I feel like you have to kind of sink into it, remember that you love it, and if you can do that, then then you know it doesn't matter really if anyone mm. else likes it. If that makes sense, like I love that you guys love my books. I love that you love the characters, but. If you didn't, I still do. And I think mm. that's, um, as a writer, I think you have to protect that kind of soft spot in you and remember that this is this is why I do it. I do it for me, not for you. But I love sharing it with you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop rambling and ask you a question, Ali. Um, I, keep having, <laughs> I keep changing between like a general you to the people watching and then like a you to Ali. And I'm like, I'm like, my whole head's going, la, la, la. Um, <laughs> But anyway, Ali, I want to, let's just switch focus a bit from writing into editing. Um, and so I'm curious, what's the editorial process like at Pantera for Pantera authors and how long does each stage take? Yeah, it's <laughs> <I> mean, really, <laughs> <laughs> how long is a piece of string? It can take a very yeah. long time. Um, <laughs> but if we're, you know, um, I mean, there's three stages of editing and as we kind of spoke about before, every single manuscript goes through these stages of editing. Um, and it's really important to remember that. So as an author, you know, you want to be 100% happy or as close to 100% happy as you can be with your manuscript before you submit it. Um, and then after you submit it, um, it's the role of sort of the publishing team or, or the publisher um, to provide you with sort of developmental or structural feedback. So that that's, you know, the big picture kind of stuff. Um, it might be things like, you know, there's a whole side plot that doesn't work. It could be things like, you know, suggestions to merge two characters into one. Um, you know, it might be that there's just a big uh, plot hole somewhere in the book. So that, that's kind of the really big, um, you know, big picture editorial piece. Uh, and often that takes a little bit of back and forth and that can really range in time depending how many changes need to be made, how dramatic those changes are. Um, and also on the author's sort of, you know, speed and availability to actually be writing. As you would know, some authors um, are lucky enough to be able to write full time. Other authors have full time or part time jobs doing something else while also writing. Um, and then the second stage of editing is copy editing or line editing. And that is sort of, you know, the much more specific editing. So it's not proofreading, um, but it might be, you know, looking for repetitions or different terms of phrases. It's kind of that line by line editing. Uh, and normally we kind of allow four weeks on our end for an editor to do the copy edit, four weeks for the author to make those changes. And then there's, you know, two weeks and two weeks and maybe one week and one week of back and forth on those changes until we're all happy again. Uh, and then the final stage is proofreading. Um, and often we'll do a proofread uh, once the manuscript is actually typeset. So once it's laid out like an actual book uh, so that, you know, we can pick up on formatting er errors as well as actual typos uh, going through. And so, you know, that, that again takes another, um, you know, maybe four weeks, five weeks, depending on how many changes there are. And again, the author's availability and also how close we've been running to deadlines and, and how soon we need to print. Uh, because, you know, that's the other thing that we, everyone adds padding along the way, but sometimes things happen, whether it's from the editor's end or the author's end. Um, and so often it's about working out what you can shift around and where to make print deadlines. Mm -hmm. Actually, do you remember my first year with you? And um, and I, I mean, I had, I think I was too awkward to actually ask. The, now I, I don't stop asking questions. Like, you cannot shut me up. And I know you're like, Lynn, stop asking questions. Um, but <laughs> but you're, you're used to it now. And you're like, you're really good about it. I mean, like, not that you would never go. Anyway, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you're you've always been you've always encouraged me to ask questions but i was always too afraid to ask questions because i had this weird like authority mentality that oh i can't ask my publisher questions anyway um i remember that i got my first edit for a carne and i because i didn't know anything i didn't know to ask about deadlines and i just remember i think i did like an entire edit in two days because i just thought i had to get it back to you really fast and i remember i was dealing with i can't it wasn't you i don't think um um, I think you stepped in after that and you're like, what are you doing editing in two days? Are you crazy? Did you sleep? Um, but I think um, whoever it was, was just like, you know, you had like four weeks for this, right? And I was like, I didn't know that. I'm now, you know, <laughs> <pro -tose." laughs> so 
I um I learned the hard way to ask questions and that was one of them. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> That's terrible. I'm glad you learned the lesson on book one and not, you know, book seventeen. <laughs> I know. I mean the problem is it did instill bad habits in me early on that I always thought, well, you know, if I can do it in two days, I might as well. And you shouldn't. And I couldn't. I really couldn't. And I, yeah, it was bad. <laughs> I think I found some kind of time traveling device. Um, thankfully, there wasn't that much editing. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm getting off track. Um, so I guess my, I want to jump onto another question because, again, we have so many of these. Um, and I think this is kind of for both of us. But the question mm. is sort of um, how much does the editing team influence the final product or the story of, of the end book, the end book of the book? The finished product. The finished product. <laughs> I mean, I guess from my perspective, um, I, you know, I think that it's it's kind of you know it takes a village. Um, you know, the author is definitely the champion, and they've put in all the hard work. But by the time it comes to an editorial team, it's about you know working together to polish it, and it's quite a collaborative process. Um, but you know, I can even think about numerous conversations that we would have had with various books in the Medoran Chronicles where, you know, we asked you questions or we pointed things out. Um, and sometimes you would say, great, you know, let's do that. Other times you would say, look, I've just tried it and it just isn't working. Um, we've got to find another way. And, you know, you would either address the problem in a different way or we would collectively kind of decide not an issue let's move on. Uh, so I think it's quite collaborative, but it is the author's baby and the author's book. And, um, you know, you know it better than anyone else and we should know it second best to anyone else. Um, and, and that's kind of the role of responsibility as well, I think. What about yeah. you? Yeah, I think um, I agree. I think, you know, the thing I have to, I'm such a people pleaser. So often if an editor says, let's do this, I'll be like, okay. But then I have to sort of stop and think and remember, well, this is just one book in a series and it has to, it has to, where the series is going, it's only in my head at this stage. So, um, you know, I have to always try and remind myself that at the end of the day, they accepted this book because they really like this book. So they're not going to hate me if I disagree with something. And so something, a really good example from the Midoran Chronicles was, um, for anyone who's read that, Nike's is Nike's or, I say Nike's, obviously I'm the author, you guys say Nick's or Nixie or whatever you want, but that character, um, I, I, he, he was like, I'm just, I'm super connected to him. And, um, and I was from the moment he came onto the page. Um, but my editor at the time said, why don't we make him a girl? And I was just like, I honestly had this like physical reaction to it. And I was like, no, he, no. And it was just such a strong, up until that point, any kind of, like at any kind of editorial comment, I'd be like, oh yeah, maybe, maybe not for, or yes or no or whatever. And like, and until we figured something out. But with that comment with Nikes, I was just like foot down. This is something that I will not yield to. And it was such a weird moment for me. Um, Cause I had that panic. Well, maybe what if they don't agree with me? And I'm like, well, if they don't agree with me too bad because Nikes is a guy. Um, <laughs> and, um, and similarly, not to the same extent, but the same question was asked about Xeraxis um, or Zero yeah. the Dracon. And I was again, like, I, and that one, I was like, you know, I could, I could probably make him a girl, but I, I was also so connected to him as a male Dracon that I was just like, you know what, this, I'm so, these are big, um, like big, big changes that would have shifted the dynamic of the stories. And as the author and as, and knowing that there were going to be multiple books later and knowing where those would go, I just had to be like, no, you know what? I respect your opinion and I can see why you're saying that for the reasons you're saying it but this is something I can't change. And, um, and that's how it works. It's collaborative. Editors, editors work with authors, authors work with editors. You respect each other's opinions. You know that it's a, it's a conversation and ultimately you both want the best things for the book and, um, and you'll get there together. So. And how great that we didn't convince you to change Nikes into a girl. <laughs> I think at the time we were very focused on making sure that there were really strong kick-ass female characters in the series um, you know, and there are, um, but making sure that, you know, beyond Alex and a few of the other girls that there continued to be some really wonderful, um, you know, side characters that were women as well. Um, but now knowing where the series has gone, I mean, how, you can't even picture where the series would be if Nikes wasn't the man that he was. And like every comment pretty much that has been coming through for this last 40 minutes has pretty much been about, you know, a Nikes love fest. So... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right. Wow. So we, 
we are um, finishing up on editorial. We kind of already touched on this uh, a little bit, um, but we do have a question about when submitting, is it best to have already had an editor edit the manuscript? Um, and, and, it, and if you do, will it be edited to the same uh, extent? Uh, and, you know, we already sort of spoke about this. I don't think that you need a professional editor, but as we've both commented before, um, you want to make sure that you're as happy as you could be with the book, knowing full well that, yes, the authors are never 100% happy and they could keep changing everything um, forever, as Lynn said before. Um, but no, I don't think it's necessary to, to have an e editor. You can, um, you know, and there are lots of places that you can work with great editors. You're in, in Australia anyway, your state writers' centres like Writing Victoria, Writing New South Wales, Queensland Writers' Centre, et cetera, et cetera, are great places um, to have mentors or to get editorial feedback. Um, I would be very wary of other services offered outside of those places that are like... Um, you know, manuscript money. <laughs> yeah, manuscript assessment agencies where you're paying and often they're telling you what you want to hear. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's necessary. I think if you've written a book, you love it, you're mostly happy with it and you feel like it's ready to go, submit it, regardless of who you've had edit it or not edit it beforehand, it will still go through the same editorial process with your publisher. So you're not saving any time if that's what you're thinking about. And I agree. I would be really, 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 if you're going down the traditional publishing path, I'd be very wary of anyone who asks you for money for anything, uh, even publishers, because that's, that's not traditional publishing, that's vanity publishing. And, and it can, like, I mean, there are different ways it can happen, but it's, and I'm not saying they're all wrong, but I would just be saying very, be very careful. Um, and with the editing, you know, if you want someone to polish a manuscript beforehand, that's your choice. Um, I didn't do it with my books, but you know, I know authors who do do it. So especially for their mm. first book. So it just, that's a personal kind of choice thing. I use um, like better readers, like the ETA readers. I have critique partners and I send them out and I, um, I just ask them, you know, can like, these are people who read a lot and they're not professionals in any way. Um, mind you, they might be booksellers or other people like that. Like, um, but they, so they are professionals. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Not like, not necessarily. Or like, okay. Yeah. Like, yeah, okay. But they're not, they're like friends. So like, they're like friends. Like they're people I know in real life. Um, or they, yeah, okay. I'm now thinking of a few of them. I'm like, okay, they're, they're, they're bookish people. Okay, this argument's going nowhere. Um, but they're people, I don't pay them for an opinion. Um, and I just say, hey, will you critique my book? Like, like with Sarah Mass, I critique her books. She doesn't pay me to do it. I do it because I'm her friend. And that way I then give an opinion of the books and my Medora books and everything like that. I give them to people. They tell me things that they like and they don't like. And I then revise from that. Um, I'm now waffling and we're also running out of time and we still have a heap of questions. So I'm going to jump on and ask Ali um, yes. about the process. Um, I feel, I feel like we've already kind of covered this, but so I'll ask you mm. just, I don't know, but kind of like how long is the process? You, you mentioned it with editing before, but like how long is the book publishing, the actual publishing process from submitting a manuscript to the release date? Normally a year. I think you mentioned it before. And that's because there's so many stages of editing and then there's a sales cycle where we're, you know, speaking to all of the major retailers and getting them excited about the book um, and having them read finished copies of it early. Uh, and then, you know, it goes into the warehouse and it has to be sent out so that all retailers receive it at the same time. Um, so there is, it is quite a long lead process. Um, it can be more than a year because there are, you know, um, great times to publish books at different periods in a year. So for example, um, you know, a debut author, um, it might be great to release them in sort of, you know, February when it's a, um, or even just a young adult author when it's that back to school summer reading period. Um, you know, for uh, some kind of, you know, chick lit book, then Mother's Day is a great peak buying period, similarly to, you know, an action packed book or a sports biography. Father's Day is a great buying period. All of the big kind of international heavy hitters, including, you know, Whisper and Weapon, <laughs> um, come out in the lead up to Christmas. Um, so that's when sort of the big names start to come out. So it's really about finding, you know, where the space is that the book will be best received and can get the most attention, both in terms of sales as well as publicity. So that that could mean that it's longer than a year because, you know, you're, you're waiting out to find that right publication period. But about a year, long story short. Yeah. Um, cool. I've rambled enough. 
back over to you. Um, how involved, you know, can you talk, I guess, a little bit about your experience with Pantera Press as an author? How involved w were you actually in the publishing process? Yeah, I was, I was, um, what's that word I'm looking for? Um, Very involved. <laughs> No, I know, but I was thinking of words, it's like, I was uncommonly very involved. So like, I've worked with other publishers and I've just been like, and, and, and it has, I've had little involvement. I've been like an email will be dropped out of nowhere and I'll be like, well, here's your cover or something like that. Or like, here, we're doing this or here, we're doing this. And I'll be like, oh, okay. But with Pantera, I've been from the very beginning with each of the books, I've been heavily involved. I've been heavily consulted. I, um, and actually it's probably, and I'm so insanely grateful for it, that it was a bit of a shock to me when I worked with a different publisher and it didn't happen. I was like, wait, don't I have an opinion? I thought I'd get an opinion of this. Um, so it was almost like I've been spoiled with Pantera to always have an opinion that's, but not just like, it's not like a pat on the head opinion. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's the author. That's her opinion. Let's ignore it. It's like, okay, this is her opinion. Let's take this under, under advisement. Um, and you know, let's discuss this, let's talk about it. And, and nine times out of 10, I think you guys actually just went with whatever I said, um, which, you know, most of the time was what you'd already said, but maybe with different tweaks and stuff. Um, but yeah, my long story short is I've, you know, it's been highly collaborative from beginning to end with Pantera. Um, and anytime I've had a problem with like, so I'm obviously talking to Ali here, who is like the top of the chain. Um, but I work with other people along the chain. But if ever I've had a problem with that chain, I've gone to Ali and she's like stepped in and fixed things anyway. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been highly collaborative and I've had, I've been, involved in every step of the way which is yeah. really really cool and actually that kind of leads me on to the next question um and that is about book covers i just mentioned covers a second ago but um we got asked a lot about how do we choose and design the book covers uh so and actually um, while you were talking lynn there were a whole bunch of comments coming up about people saying you know they loved Akane cover so much. That's why they started the series. We love the book yeah. covers. You know, there's been quite a few comments while you were just talking about, you know, your input in the process. So yeah. people are already, <laughs> you know, asking. Awesome. Well, as a publisher, how do you tell us how, how do you come up with, how do you work with a designer? Um, answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think from our perspective, um, we're looking for something that is, you know, beautiful, um, but similarly and very importantly that it speaks to the reader of the book. So it needs to tell the consumer that we're targeting that the book is for them. And it also needs to tell the specific retail channel that it's going into um, who the audience of the book is. So we're kind of, you know, looking at those three key pieces um, and it's important that you get all of those pieces right. And, um, you know, it's very easy um, particularly when working with authors who haven't published before, um, for them to be saying, you know, I just think that this book looks so pretty, you know, I'd love my book to look like this. Um, but in actual fact, there are kind of all these other elements at play. Um, that said, you know, for me, I think one of the most important things is that the book cover is really reflective of the story. And it frustrates me to no end when you go into a bookstore and you see a book um, and it has a character on the cover, whether you can see their face or not. Uh, but you, you know, when you start to read the book, you realize that whoever's on the cover is the main character or a side character, and they look nothing like the book description. Um, yeah. Like I, I remember reading this great book um, that was all about, you know, the main character was this Irish girl with fiery red hair. And then the girl on the cover was this like older lady with like mousy brown hair. Okay. And you just think, did the editorial team not speak to the design team? You know, how does this happen? So, and the author. <laughs> uh, well, that's the thing. I think that's when author input is so important. You know, I, I think with you, it's sort of been a little bit different in that, um, you know, we've been designing covers together for a really long time. Um, and on top of that, you kind of have, I mean, you have a great creative eye yourself, but you also had a bit of a background in graphics um, and design stuff. And so, you know, you have such an attention to detail um, and just really good broad ideas. And so that has ended up, you know, being a truly collaborative process, I think. But, you know, what do you think? 
Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it's funny because as you've been talking, I've been remembering like each of the different covers, the both the, the Medoran series and the Whisper series. And like, I actually put a post up, I think about a year ago of like the original draft covers for the Medoran Chronicles and then what the final result was. And it's on my webpage, but it's so fascinating to see how they change. But even stuff like with the, like one of the early drafts of the Akane cover, like um, just like that attention to detail you mentioned, like there was a wedding ring on Alex's ring finger and we were all kind of like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> might want to get rid of that, she's 16. Um, so just like, because designers haven't read the book, like the cover designers haven't read it, they get given like a bit of info from an editor and like maybe a scene or two and they're like, and then just like here, this is what we want you to kind of do. And they've got to go with what they can go with. Um, but it's really interesting. I love, I love covers. It's my favorite part of the publishing uh, process just because it's so exciting to see what might come out and, and how things, how things change from the first one to the, like the draft to the finished product, but also just seeing the concept of a story a, you know multiple page story just on a cover I just I love it. it it gets my mind happy but I'm such a cover snob like I said before so you know yeah <laughs> I do love it though so. some people in the comments have started telling us which their favorite covers are so we are watching while we're chatting um so if you want to tell us what your favorite covers are that would be a fun thing for us to see while You're we're talking about the next question them. Yeah, they're all freaking out about that wedding ring. There was no wedding, guys. She was 16 and she hadn't even stepped into Medora at that stage. It was just um, the stock image we were using on the cover. <laughs> yeah. She also had like a white um, like business attire and a ponytail and she looked like she was about 40 years old from the back. So, you know, we took her hair out and we gave her a leather jacket and, and yeah. We made it cool. We made it, we made a, I think your words at the time were like, let's make her look like she's stepping into the Hunger Games. And I was like, we wanted to live, but okay, that worked. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. And or she well, didn't, did she? say. Did she? I don't know, those who haven't read the series. <laughs> um, all right, so my next question is, it's kind of jumping around a little bit, but um, would you say, is it harder or easier for a standalone book or a series to be picked up by a publisher? I think that, um, you know, it's a good question. Um, it doesn't necessarily affect our decision. Um, and, you know, Pantera are known for doing things a little bit differently, I should mention. So um, with a series, most publishers will kind of see how the first book goes um, and wrap it up enough that if there's no other book afterwards, readers and fans still feel satisfied enough and they'll see how that book sells. And if it sells well, then they will, you know, start working on the second book and so on and so on and so forth. So you will see, um, not often, but sometimes series that you love that are kind of cut short halfway through because the books just aren't selling. And even though there might be a really dedicated, you know, readership or fan base, um, they're just not selling to the level that would make them commercially viable. Um, for us, we had a very different bent from the beginning. You know, our focus was on building the brands of new authors. Um, and so we had a very different perspective on that. And, and, you know, we knew that our authors didn't have a track record, but we also as publishers did not have a big track record. You know, we, when we started 11 years ago, we were the new kids on the block. Um, and so what was the actual question that we were talking about? Standalone <laughs> or series? <laughs> um, I think that, uh, a series can be great, but you you kind of know that you are um, watching the sales to see how it goes. Um, a standalone is easy to sell. Um, it's probably actually more of a thing to consider when an author is partway through a series that may or may not be doing as well. And then you think, should we be releasing a standalone or a separate series to kind of, you know, increase interest or publicity and, and that kind of thing. But Either way, if you're writing a series, write a series. And if you're writing a standalone, write a standalone would be my advice. I, I love it. And I need to apologize for all my facial expressions the whole time you were talking because the comments, there's every, like, there's a lot of love for Caden and everyone's saying everyone needs a Caden, but also like Lynette has raised our standard for guys and I love all this because it's hilarious. So, it's true. You have. Yeah. I mean, everyone does need a Caden. Um, but yes, interestingly, with the standalone series thing, 
I sold Whisper to America before Australia and they took the first book um, and they were going to wait and see how it sold. Australia, Pantera bought the rights to it. Um, and America ended up, like, after the first book, they did end up offering another deal for, like, for the second book as well. Um, but it was that, that, um, that chopped, um, that wait and see how it goes thing. Uh, whereas with the Medora Chronicles from the beginning, you guys were like, let's just take, let's, let's do the whole series. Let's do this. So that was, yeah, I like that Pantera does a different thing there. Because it also gives you a bit more confidence as an author that, well, I'm not about to lose a series halfway through, um, which I know a lot of authors who have a series has stopped partway through and it's, it's devastating to the author because they, you know, and for the reader, for that matter. As a reader, I don't like when a series doesn't end. Um, we only have about five minutes left before we're going to get cut off. We have two questions left, but one of them um, is a billion people ask me this question, so I think we really need to answer it. Um, mm. if that's okay with you. So the question is, I had a lot of people, I have a lot of younger readers. And so a lot of one people wanted to know how old you have to be to get published, whether someone under 18 can get published, can get an offer. Um, they also want to know how old is the youngest person who's been published by Pantera? What was their book about? And do you encourage people under 18 to get their books published? That was really fast. So I think the main question is, how would you say, what does age make a difference in publishing? Age does not make a difference. Um, we recently, uh, earlier this year or late last year, signed a new author who's 16. Uh, her name is Jean Hinchliffe and she um, is a very well-known activist. Um, she was the person who organised the uh, school climate strikes um, in New South Wales. Uh, and she's writing a book on, you know, activism and finding your own voice, um, sort of a non-fiction guide for us. So you certainly don't need to be 18. Um, however, if you're not 18, uh, you know, it's important that your parents know or your legal guardian knows that you're submitting. Um, and it's important that they're able to sort of support you along the journey. Um, they, they obviously need to provide consent when it comes to signing a contract on your behalf. Uh, and then you can re-sign when you hit 18. But long story short, there's no, uh, there's no age limit at all. All ages are welcome to submit. Um, and the only other thing to really consider is, do you have the time to go through the editorial process? So Jean, for example, um, is about to start year 12. Um, and so, you know, we really had to time the editorial schedule and then the publishing schedule and the publicity schedule uh, around when she would have availability so that we weren't taking her away from her exam. So there are those extra things to kind of factor in. Uh, but yes, all ages, if you love writing and you think your book is ready, certainly submit it um, and don't think that your age will be a hindrance. Perfect. Good answer. And similarly, I know authors who got their publishing deals when they were teenagers as well. But likewise, I also know authors who've been like, got their publishing deals in their 80s. Like there is no um, people, especially young adult, the demographic, people seem to think that there's like this age between 20 and, and 40 that, that you know, that especially in the 20s is like a, a time when um, people get published. And that's, that's just, that's not true. It's just, I think we see a lot of the most popular um, authors who are in that like 25 to 35 age group. And we think, oh, okay, well then that's what it is. But that's, you know, 80 year olds, 16 year olds, whatever, anything year olds, there is no, a good book is a good book, um, no matter who it's written by or where they're from or how old they are or whether they like hot chocolate or not. I mean, that one's really, you know, <laughs> everyone hopefully likes chocolate, like and hot chocolate, but Obviously, I have Friday night thoughts in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, final question, because I think we've got one and a half minutes left. Um, okay. Do you have to study writing to be a good writer and to get a publishing deal? You know, did you study or did you do any specific subjects that you think helped? Oh, sorry, I thought you were finishing your sentence. <laughs> you nah, kind of went, just, you went yeah. up. Okay, you just helped. Helped, um, yeah, no, no more words. <laughs> No more words, good, because we've got one minute and 40, 39 seconds because it's timing down, which is helpful. Um, I did not study. As I mentioned before, I had no idea what I was doing. I knew no one in the writing world. Um, I, I mean, I know authors who've got creative writing degrees and who've gone to a lot of uh, workshops and a lot of masterclasses and they've done a lot of, a lot of um, personal development to learn how to write. Uh, I did not. English was my least favourite subject in school. I didn't like it at all, uh, but I was always an avid reader. So for me, reading 
taught me more than any kind of writing class ever could. Um, so I'm a huge advocate for reading and not so much learning. In fact, the first workshop I ever went to was one I taught. Uh, so that was a learning experience. I was like, I had no idea what I was doing, but um, it was fun. And I just, I taught what I'd learned, self-learned. So we have 51 seconds. We should probably say our goodbyes. And, um, and is there anything else you want to add to this, what we've been talking about? Nothing else from me. I think we've, uh, I think we've covered a huge amount of ground. To be honest, when we were looking through these questions, we didn't think that we'd get through half of them. So, you know, <laughs> finally, both of us being real fast talkers has worked to our advantage. Um, and admittedly, we only managed one page, not the other page. So, that's you know, true. We got, we'll do it another time. There's a heap more questions and, and yeah. yeah. But this was fun. But, but for other questions, the other page, I don't know if you can see it, it does say additional questions if we have time. So... You know, exactly. we were optimistic. <laughs> we now have nine seconds left. So I think we're going to say goodbye, guys. I'll try and save this. We'll both try and save it and repost it. But we're going to lose you in a second. Thanks, guys. Thanks for